Obama strikes back. The president lashes out at Republican presidential candidates on his African tour. Praying for the victims, a Catholic church pays homage to the women killed in a Louisiana movie theater shooting. Protecting the flock, how Christians under threat in Kenya keep the faith. Ecco, mi sono iscritto. The countdown begins. Pope Francis becomes the first to sign up for next year's World Youth Day in Krakow, Poland. Those stories and more on EWTN News Nightly for Monday, July 27, 2015. Good evening and thank you for joining us. I'm Wyatt Goolsby with your News Now. President Obama is weighing in on campaign politics, skewering several top Republicans at a news conference in Ethiopia. A game of political ping pong spanning two continents. It started with Republican presidential candidate Mike Huckabee's comments to Brit Baer News over the weekend, where he compared the Iran nuclear deal to the Holocaust. Uh, he's so naive, he would trust the Iranians and he would take the Israelis and basically march them to the door of the oven. At a news conference in Ethiopia, President Obama, who has for the most part avoided the 2016 election, fired back. You know, the particular comments of, uh, of Mr. Huckabee uh, are, I think, part of just a general pattern that we've seen that uh, would be considered uh, ridiculous if it weren't so sad. Huckabee's response? What's ridiculous and sad is that President Obama does not take Iran's repeated threats seriously. The president also called out Donald Trump, condemning him for saying Senator John McCain is only a war hero because he was captured. That arises out of a culture where you know, those kinds of outrageous attacks have become far too commonplace and get circulated nonstop. The heated rhetoric comes just 10 days before the first Republican primary debate. The outspoken Trump currently leads the pack, but that same CNN ORC poll shows 39 percent of registered voters expect Jeb Bush to ultimately win the Republican contest. Before Ethiopia, President Obama visited Kenya where he criticized the government on its position on gay rights, but the Kenyan president pushed back. As an African American in the United States, uh, I am painfully aware of the history of what happens when people are treated differently under the law. This issue is not really an issue that is on the foremost mind of Kenyans, and that is the fact. Obama's father was born in Kenya. Now to some of the other stories our EWTN News Nightly team has been covering in today's world. A controversial gay rights ordinance in Houston could appear on the November ballot. The Texas Supreme Court ruled Friday that the city council must repeal the ordinance or bring it up to a vote. The ordinance, known as HERO, allows members of the opposite sex to use each other's restrooms, among other things. The law made headlines after church leaders sued and the city tried to subpoena their sermons. The Coast Guard says they are scouring the waters looking for two teens who disappeared off the coast of Florida. On Sunday, rescuers found the teen's boat capsized about 70 miles from where the fishermen were last seen. A Coast Guard officer says they are still optimistic they are going to find them. The teens were on a trip from Florida to the Bahamas Friday when they disappeared. On the campaign trail in Iowa, Democratic presidential candidate Hillary Clinton voices her support for the Iran nuclear deal. People have asked me all across Iowa, what do you think? What I think is that this is an important step in trying to put the lid on Iran's nuclear weapons program. Is it perfect? No, it was negotiated by human beings. But is it better than the alternatives? Yes, it is. Clinton is also pushing her plan to combat climate change. If she is elected, she pledged to have more than a half a billion solar panels installed nationwide by the end of her first term. The State Department takes Malaysia and Cuba off its blacklist of countries failing to combat modern-day slavery. Critics say politics is swaying the rankings in its annual human trafficking report. They contend that Malaysia's upgrade is related to its participation in a U.S.-backed trade agreement among Pacific Rim countries. Today, the department released the annual report on how 188 governments around the world have performed in fighting human trafficking. Holly Buchhalter is Vice President of Government Relations and Advocacy with the International Justice Mission. Holly, what do you make of this move to remove Malaysia and Cuba from the blacklist? 
Well, let's, let's talk about what the so-called blacklist is. It is a list of countries that are not meeting minimum standards to combat slavery and trafficking. And if you read the narrative on those two countries and others, you'll see that they are not meeting minimum standards. And the fact that they were upgraded apparently without serious uh, changes and improvements in the, their, their quite poor records causes people to wonder, is there, are there other political considerations involved? And I'm afraid that is the case. Um, but, you know, I don't want it to overshadow the fact that there's 188 countries in that report. It is overwhelmingly an important and useful tool for, for fighting trafficking and slavery around the world, which is why those tier rankings have got to be scrupulously correct and borne out by the actual facts on the ground. And like I said, for you who have studied this for so long, you know there's so many areas, so many countries where there are problems. There's 23 countries that are still designated as tier three, the worst of human trafficking defenders. Are there any bright spots that you can tell? There are a lot, there are a lot of bright spots, um, but it's also worthy of, uh, of note that there's 188 countries and almost every country in the world, and certainly including ours, has problems with trafficking and slavery. The real indicators are what are governments doing about that. There are some bright spots, and I'd like to tell you about one in our own experience at International Justice Mission. We've been working in Cambodia for about a dozen years, and Cambodia used to be ground zero for the place where foreign pedophiles will go to exploit, buy and exploit very young children. And we've found over our many years in the country working and partnering with the Cambodian government that it's become a quite unlikely hero in the anti-trafficking anti world. They have reduced trafficking of children by an extraordinary amount. Uh, it went from being maybe a third of those in, in mm -hmm. sexual exploitation down to about 2.2%. They're not perfect, they have a way to go yet, but that is a sea change and something that the world should really be studying and looking at and finding out how can we have more of that and how can that incredible progress in Cambodia be sustained. Yeah, like I said, it really gives a lot of other countries hope to have a solid example like Cambodia, so I'm glad, I'm glad you mentioned so that. And like I said, it's a good example for the rest of the world. Holly Brookhalter, thanks so much for being with us. We appreciate it. Glad to be here. Pope Francis signs himself up for next year's World Youth Day in Poland with the touch of a finger. Ecco, mi sono iscritto. During Sunday's Angelus, Pope Francis used a tablet computer to open up registration for the Catholic Youth Festival. It will take place in Krakow next July. The Holy Father was joined by two young people as he extended an invitation to the world's Catholic youth to join him. Coming up, we take a closer look at a group of women working to unite feminism with the pro-life movement. Plus, how the Catholic Church is helping a Louisiana community in mourning after a fatal theater shooting. The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed that a person took and sowed in a field. It is the smallest of all the seeds, yet when full grown, it is the largest of plants. It becomes a large bush. Today's gospel reading according to Matthew. Thank you for joining us this evening. I'm Wyatt Goolsby. Well, welcome back to the program, Dr. Charmaine Yost, the president of Americans United for Life. Charmaine, the recent Planned Parenthood videos have reignited the debate on abortion. I know a lot of people feel strongly about seeing this. As a pro-life leader, what's your response, I guess strategic response, if you will? Well, I think this is so important, and thank you, Wyatt, so much for taking a look at this issue, because it has really created this remarkable moment in our country today where you just can't look away. Um, it has gripped people, people who have wanted to kind of leave abortion over in this corner of rationalization, and um, it's, it's brought it home into people's living rooms, and they've said, this is, this is so much more than what I expected. And with Planned Parenthood, they're just doing their typical game of denying and dodging and um, trying to focus the attention elsewhere, just blaming other people, when in actual fact the evidence against them is really quite significant and very damning. And like I say, when you have multiple videos like that, like I said, right. the evidence just starts to, to, to mount. Yeah. Uh, last week, the Centers for Disease Control uh, reported that one in five sexually active teen girls have used the morning after pill. Why do you think this is so common and pervasive in our culture? Well, you know, the tragic thing of it is, is we predicted this would happen. It's not a surprise at all. In 2006, this administration moved to make the morning after pill an over-the-counter uh, drug for anyone over the age of 18, and subsequently they've uh, completely eliminated the age restriction entirely. Now, the data we're seeing would not encompass the, um, the elimination of the entire 
age, age restriction. But it's not a surprise at all that when you make it over the counter that more people are going to use it. And even younger people, at the time we were predicting and saying that older young men would get hold of the drug and give it to younger girls. And I, you know, would assume that this is part of the dynamic that we're seeing is that it is now out there in the culture and it's so easily accessible. The problem that we're finding is that, you know, this isn't a drug that has been tested in this way in terms of this kind of extensive use without a doctor's supervision. There are reasons not to use it. There are very good medical contraindications contraindications for it. Um, so I think it's very troubling and, and a great concern. Really quickly, the abortion rate is declining. What are some of the factors that are driving that trend? Well, this is one of the most positive things that we're seeing um, right now is this overall trend of, abor of abortion declining. And frankly, I think a large part of the reason is because we are part of the post-sonogram generation. Mm -hmm. um, the earliest baby picture that most kids these days growing up ever ever knew of was the one, was their sonogram picture that hung on the refrigerator. And so the humanity of the unborn continues to be something that is increasingly difficult to turn away from and to look away from. And so actually if we if we put together these two things that we've talked about, the Planned Parenthood videos and the decline in abortion through the use of sonogram technology and also um, prenatal surgery, all of these things coming together are, are causing kind of a reevaluation of abortion in our culture today. Sometimes it's it's the more you know and like I said, once you actually are able to visually see it, right. it really helps. Exactly. Uh, Dr. Charmaine Yost, Americans United for Life, thanks so much for being with Thank us. Thank you for having me. You may not always associate feminists with the pro-life movement, but one group is trying to change that. Katherine Zeltner has more tonight. Hey, ho, ho! Hey, hey! Birth control is here to stay! Ho, ho! When you think of a feminist, what comes to mind? How is it that you can be a feminist and pro-life person? Meet Saren Foster and the stereotype may be shattered. She founded Feminists for Life in 1972 to address the root causes that lead women to abortion. Foster says if you're for women's rights, it makes sense to be pro-life. Women deserve better than abortion. Her group reaches out to universities because college-age women have the highest risk of abortion. For many members of Feminists for Life, those statistics reflect their stories. When I had my abortion experience, I didn't feel that people were being very pro-woman towards me as a woman. Joanna Young was in an abusive relationship when she became pregnant. Her boyfriend forced her to get an abortion and then... The next day, my abuser dumped me. Young now fights for life. Joyce McCauley Benner was raped in college. After finding out she was pregnant, Macaulay Benner decided to carry her son full term. Women have a strength that I think that they don't realize, and that's something that I want to bring. That's the message that I want to bring, is that we're stronger than we think we are. That's the strength these modern-day feminists want to share. And that we have to create a world where pregnancy in, is celebrated and motherhood is, you know, support. Mothers are supported, fathers are honored, and every child is given their chance at life. So more women can flex their motherhood muscles. Feminists for Life knows the financial challenges and decisions women face when they become pregnant. That's why their magazine offers the Raising Kids on a Shoestring Issue. It includes resources and advice so women can have support when they have their baby. Wyatt? It is a gr good group and a very important message. Katherine Zeltner, thanks very much. A Catholic church pays homage to the victims of a Louisiana movie theater shooting that left two dead and nine wounded. Our Lady of Fatima in Lafayette set up a memorial for 21-year-old Macy Bro and 33-year-old Jillian Johnson and their families. John Russell Hauser stood up about 20 minutes into the showing of Trainwreck and fired on the audience. He then tried to escape but turned back as police officers approached. He reloaded and fired into the crowd before killing himself with a single shot inside the theater. Joining us on the phone is Father Chester Arsenault from Lafayette, Louisiana. Uh, Father, your parish, the Cathedral of St. John the Evangelist, held a candlelight vigil last night for the victims. Tell us, how does the community begin to heal after such a shocking event? Well, it's very important that we embrace the darkness that happened, and it was an opportunity for us to gather in prayer with the reality of that darkness that had just covered us as a community. And it was wonderful to see that um, about 400 people attended. Uh, they had an opportunity to light a candle and we, in, we entered the ceremony in silence and we just prayed before the crucifix. 
as people had placed their candles there. And it was a wonderful opportunity to hear the word of God that truly affirms us in, in those moments and give us hope in the midst of despair. Yeah, certainly gives strength to, to so many people. You yourself went to the multiple hospitals, actually, the night of the shooting to console families. What do you tell people at a time like that? Well, it's a, a very difficult time to be the minister of those souls who are confused. Some of them are angry. Uh, they're dismay. And the first thing I wanted to do was to pray with the victims. And I had the opportunity to do that for most of them, go into their rooms, pray or anoint them. And then I went and consoled the family to let the family know how they were doing. And in that time, all you can do is truly give what we truly possess in our faith, the hope that in the midst of this darkness, God's love and mercy is upon us and to reach out in compassion and prayer and pray with the families and give them the ability to be comforted in the words of our Savior. And that's, and like I said, that's so important for so many people and having the church there as a rock for so many. Father uh, Chester Arsenault, c coming to us from Lafayette, Louisiana, thanks so much for your time. You're welcome. During his trip to Kenya, President Barack Obama committed more resources to fighting terror in East Africa. Christians in the Kenyan town of Garissa are still coping with a recent massacre there at the hands of the militant group Al-Shabaab. Susie Pinto reports. Sunrise over the Tana River. Traffic starts to flow over the bridge and into Garissa town. Al-Shabaab militants brutally attacked Garissa University back in April killing 147 people, mostly students. Today, the school still stands empty and desolate. The faithful gather for Sunday Mass at Our Lady of Perpetual Consolation, the Garissa Cathedral. This Sunday, like nearly every other, brought with it threats from al-Shabaab. If you worship here, they're told, you'll die. They're praying under armed guard, but this is one risk they are still willing to take. Every Sunday I'm here. It's my cathedral. Yeah, I'm here. I was baptized in this church. The Bishop of Garissa, Joseph Alessandro, along with his fellow bishops and nuns, have been a constant in this community. It's not a matter of choice. It's our duty to remain here, no? Even the Pope, Yes, he had words of encouragement to us. He asked us to convey his condolences to the families who suffered and lost their dear ones, to people who are injured, and also he promised that we will continue to pray for Kenya, for peace in Kenya, for unity in Kenya. At the invitation of the diocese, Bishop Alessandro says the Pope added Kenya to his Africa trip in November. He says members of the congregation will be chosen to travel to Nairobi to meet him, a trip of a lifetime. For now, though, he and his priests are focusing on the daily task of keeping their flock safe as best they can. We are people of God. We are people of faith. God never abandons us. And maybe in moments when we feel that we are left on our own, there are those moments that God may, might be very close to us no? inwardly, even if we don't feel him. Susie Pinto, EWTN News Nightly. Up next. Catholic leaders challenged the faithful to affirm the church's teaching on marriage following the Supreme Court's recent ruling. And how one woman says she's able to live out her God-given gifts thanks to a law created 25 years ago. Religious freedom is not only that of private thought or worship, it is the liberty to live both privately and publicly according to the ethical principles resulting from found truth. A quote from Pope Francis speaking on religious freedom last year. 
Thank you for joining us this evening. I'm Wyatt Goolsby. Catholic leaders say the faithful need to speak more clearly and firmly on church teaching following the Supreme Court's decision to legally redefine marriage. In a recent article for First Things, a Dominican theologian says Catholics cannot compare gay marriage to divorce. He argues redefining marriage is a greater threat than divorce. Philadelphia Archbishop Ch Charles Chaput made a point of sharing the article with his archdiocese. Joining us now is the author of that article, Father Dominic Legg. He is a theological professor at the Dominican House of Studies in Washington. Father, why do you say redefining marriage cannot be compared to divorce? Both are bad things, obviously. Well, I think there are at least, uh, there are many reasons, at least two we could name uh, right off the bat. One has to do with the internal life of the church. Advocates for more liberal divorce laws are not pushing the church to change its teaching about divorce or not pushing for bishops to praise divorce or bless uh, the practice of divorce. Uh, but the opposite actually is the case with respect to gay rights advocates. They do want to use this to exert first cultural and perhaps even eventually legal pressure on the church to praise and bless divorce, uh, gay marriages. So that presents a, a greater challenge to the church in its own internal life. But I think a second uh, reason is that divorce recognizes the nature of a marriage as between a man and a woman, a kind of relationship capable of generating new life something that uh, gay couples are not able to do without help from outsiders. Some argue it's, it's no longer scandalous if a Catholic institution hires someone who's divorced, so shouldn't it be scandalous then to hire someone who's in a gay marriage? I mean, how do you look at that? Well, sometimes people would say, well, it's not a scandal. I mean, no big deal. Nobody's shocked by it. But in fact, scandal, the way, for example, Jesus uses it in the Gospels, is not about a psychological shock, but about a stumbling block. Uh, something that might lead someone else into sin. So if the church were to just go silent about this issue uh, and pretend like it doesn't matter, would people begin to think that maybe it's not so important? Would people begin to think that, in fact, the church doesn't really object to it? I think even with divorce, we've seen that, you know, the more divorce has become widespread, the easier it is for people to fall into that kind of situation. And that's exactly what scandal is. And like I said, there's so much pressure from uh, mainstream media, from society to sort of normalize uh, so-called gay marriage. So we appreciate your coming in and encouraging Catholics to speak firmly on that. Father Dominic Legg, thanks so much for being with us. Thanks for having me. It's a sweeping law that has opened doors, jobs, and a new life for millions of Americans. President George H.W. Bush signed the Americans with Disabilities Act 25 years ago. Tonight, our Jason Calvi shows us how the law is impacting lives today. As a kid, Juliette Rizzo developed three physical disabilities. Honestly, I was diagnosed as uh, unable to work. But that's not putting the brakes on her leadership role here at the Department of Education. She says it's thanks to the Americans with Disabilities Act. I'm here today living out my, my values and giving glory to God in the work that I do. You can find the legacy of the Americans with Disabilities Act around every corner, whether it's the cutouts or the curve that make it easy for a wheelchair or our equipment to get by, or the special parking spots you see all over town. The ADA covers an estimated 55 million Americans. It mandates that employers consider disabled applicants equally with others. It also opens up access to public buildings and transportation. Yeah, I don't think 25 years ago I would have been riding in this uh, fully accessible uh, taxi cab. I think we've had access to transportation, access to um, apartment buildings. I'm able to, you know, live on the second floor of an apartment building and easily get in and out. I'm able to go to the new movie theater by my house. Faith leaders, including Catholics, urged passage of the ADA. The bishops wrote a letter of support for it, and one of the uh, sponsors of the bill read that letter of support from that letter of support on the floor of the uh, Senate as he was introducing the bill. 25 years later, and the doors of the classroom and the boardroom are open for Juliet. In Washington, Jason Calvi, EWTN News Nightly. Thanks, Jason. Great story. And we thank you for watching our newscast tonight. Brian will be back tomorrow here on the Anchor Desk. Until tomorrow, like us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter, and watch again anytime on EWTN's YouTube page. For all of the EWTN News Nightly team, I'm Wyatt Goolsby. Good night, and God bless.